computer. Cool. So let's go to our Lucy chart diagram. So last class, what we did was we connected from a client, which is Microsoft, sorry, Firefox. We connected to a server in North Virginia over the internet, right? <clears throat> right. And um, this server has a public IP address. This is the public IP address and also has a private IP address. We said that the clients, our clients has a public IP address, right? What link, Isabel, what link are you referring to? The Zoom link, you must have gotten the link um, via, via YouTube to your email that says a video was shared with you privately on YouTube. The email that you gave me for the class, that's the email that you get the video for. If you have multiple emails and that's what you use, then it's not gonna, you're not gonna be able to get the video, right? So just so you you know. Um, so oh, not sure. Okay. Yeah, it has to be the email that you provided to me that you, you use to um to get the video for class. Okay. So like this is a video that I put here. This is a place I created. I did create a playlist called um, Cloud SRE 2024, but the videos in this playlist are private. See that? It's private. Let me refresh it. See how many how many views it got, so that I can know who studied and who did not study. So in here, this is the playlist, and here are the videos. And look at that, it got nine views. So some people watched it over the weekend. So I did share it privately, okay? Privately. Let me put the, the link in the chat again. So that's how I'm gonna be sharing every video, okay? So that you know only you can have access to it. So this is class one, connecting to a cloud server. So those are class two, connecting to an Azure server. So they're gonna to connect to Azure. And I'm gonna show you how to connect to Azure, Microsoft Azure server. Microsoft Azure has more security than AWS. We're going to talk about that, okay? So the before, last class, we did connect for AWS server, right? So I'm going to just go over that real quickly. This is what we did. We created a, a domo, a corporate domo. We did create a server with AWS. I'm going to create one real quick. You guys just watch. Skip for now. went to EC2, or you can go to services on that compute. EC2 is right there. Virtual servers in the cloud. And then I was able to launch instance. It's called an instance. And it's one instance. I called it my first server or whatever name you want to call it, right? We did create Amazon Linux server, right? This one. And then we did leave it as like default. I already created a key pair. I don't have to create another key pair again. I already have one. I can just reuse this key pair here. So that's one thing with AWS, you can reuse the same key pair. You don't have to create a new key pair every time. You can reuse the same key pair that already exists. As long as you downloaded the key pair and it's stored in your downloads folder, you're good. Network, make sure that auto assign enable is there. If you're creating a web server, if you're creating any kind of server, that needs to be public, right? The servers up here, these servers in this layer right here need to be public. They must have a public IP address. So you must make sure this is enabled for those type of servers. A server that is behind, that is behind here, a server that is behind here. Oh, okay. I know what's happening. The servers that are down here, like this one down here, are private. So only a private IP address is, is allowed to connect to them, right? But they still have public, right? They have a public IP and a private IP. But these servers talk to each other using a private IP address, right? And the low balance, I can talk to them as well. The low balance has also a server using a private IP address. But we SRE users will connect to the server using what? The public IP address. But we are connecting to, from their intranet. 
intranet, not their internet. We'll talk more about how to connect to these servers privately using something called a bastion host, which we're going to look at today. Right? AWS has bastion host too, but you have to create it with Azure. Azure has it already created, and then you can just use it. And I'll draw the diagram about that before we even get into it, right? We'll draw a diagram. This is what we're going to do to the clients. But we're going to be in Microsoft Azure today. Microsoft. So hopefully you have your accounts created. We'll do it after break, after lunch, after the, that's a lunch break. <laughs> after our break, we'll connect to Microsoft Azure. I didn't even have lunch break today. That's how busy I've been, right? So the server is going to be in Azure and this, the client is Firefox, right? Right here, boom. And this will have a public IP as per usual. And this will have a public IP as well. Right, so public IP connects to public IP like that. And client connects to the server using what? By providing what? A key pair. The key pair we just created, right? Remember? This key pair we're creating right here. This key pair, this Debo key pair. This is a credential that this since we downloaded, since I downloaded a key pair on my downloads folder, I have that key pair. If I look for dot PM. I have that key pair somewhere right here. Where is that key pair? Dot PM somewhere Debo. Somewhere somewhere D Debo under the D. Uh, Debo right here. Debo.pm. There you go. That's it. So I have that key pair on my local machine. And because I have that key pair, I'm going to give that key pair to the server when I want to connect to it. All right. Okay. Cool. So this is in AWS, this is in the Azure, and everything. Anywhere you want to connect using key pair, you have to provide the key pair to the server here in Virginia. And we're going to connect to it. So that's what we're doing. Network settings, public. We're going to allow connection from anywhere. Anywhere means 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0. This is where This is what anywhere means. If you want to do a specific IP, for example, I'm going to connect from my IP, only my IP, I'm going to choose this option. Now, anywhere is less secure because when you do anywhere, it means anyone can connect to your server if they have your public IP address. But if you do my IP only, only you alone can connect to your server. Okay? That's the difference. For now, we're going to be doing anywhere. On the job, it won't be it won't be anywhere or my IP. On the job, in the real world, it will be custom. And you're going to put a custom range. You're going to put a range here. But the, your network team will give you the range of IP addresses to use. Right? You will not know. You will not know. They will give you a range of IP addresses to use. Or you don't have to create security groups. The security or the networking team will do that. And you just use it. But for right now, we're going to be using it anyway. But this is not secure. That's why you have this one in here. Okay? Next thing is storage. That storage, 8 gigabytes is default storage. It's a root volume. It's not encrypted. It means it's open, right? It's not encrypted. And that's that. And we launch an instance. Was Is everyone able to perform this launch instance process? Please, I need, I need verbal confirmation or... A confirmation like a thumbs up reaction in the chat, like reaction, like a so Zoom has these things, right? These reaction things, right? That you can just say thumbs up or yes. Do you guys see that in Zoom? Zoom has that stuff. Okay, cool. So we go to instances running. You see the instances are running. So let's wait for it, let, let it run. Cool. So new topic introduction to cloud computing. Right? So what is cloud computing? We saw it a little bit in the demo, right? But cloud computing is just a group of computers in a, in, the, in a remote location where we can access it over the internet, right? That's all it is, right? That's all it is. You see all these things, the card reader, all these things, right? Satellite dish. So, but before cloud was on-premise. So I want to show you what on-premises look like. On-premises is an office. 
on-premise location. It's an office where servers are stored, right? On-premise means physical. Like this. Copy this image and use it here. Okay. This is on premise. So, on premise, is a physical location where offices and servers are kept and run daily. That's the on-premise location. For example, um, AT&T on-premise location is in Dallas, Texas, right? Or uh, let's use a huge one, Toyota, Toyota head, Toyota Plano office. Right. This is the office. It's huge. It's a huge campus that hosts about um, I don't know. It's the it's a campus. They have a football field, all this things. It's a huge campus. You know? So, and they have thousands of employees that work here. So this is their this is Toyota's on-premise. They have a they have a room or a whole building in here only for servers. This is this is on-premise. Okay, and so on-premise have been around since the beginning of computer systems. Whereas cloud is what? You have AWS cloud, you have Microsoft Azure cloud, you have Google cloud. And what is this? It's simply a bunch of servers. Yeah, virtual machines kept why cloud is a shared pool of computer and servers. Shared pool of computers and servers available on demand in a remote unknown location that's what cloud is but not to worry i have notes what cloud, what this is so let's talk about that let's jump into the notes i'll send you guys this notes i have lots of notes if you guys like notes i'll send a lot to you but we're not going to go through every single piece just because i'm trying to get to the main thing right but it's you know, still doing fundamentals so we're going to talk about the concept of cloud the evolution towards cloud computing the history of cloud cloud computing architectures and then the benefit and limitations of cloud computing Right. If you have any questions, please ask me. So, cloud computing method is is uh, refers to running applications or software related to data in the central computer systems, and providing customers or users that use them through the internet. Again, you can only use the cloud through the internet. Without internet, you cannot use the cloud. You can only use the cloud through the internet. Right. Over here, everything that you see here. And this, uh, let me use a region actually, uh, region. like this. This is the internet. All right. Your client is inside the internet. Your client has internet, your server has internet. That's how they're able to connect. Without the internet, there's no connection between client and server, right? And in this type, this environment, let's say this is Azure. This is Azure Cloud. Azure Cloud. So even though your Firefox is not in there, like that, there's internet in the cloud. And there's also internet at home. At home. You have internet, right? And then it's, it's Azure. So you take this key pair. That you have at home, and you provide it to the server, and the server allow you to the server allow you to connect. Okay, we're gonna see that. 
So cloud computing is the model for enabling on, in, uh, convenience on demand. I don't know what this word is. Don't worry about the word, right? It's just convenient. Cloud computing is convenient on demand network access. This word is key, network access. Again, you, without the internet or network, you cannot access the cloud, right? Without the network, you cannot access the cloud. So it's very, very important to make sure that you know that, you know, Without the internet, you cannot access the cloud. Okay. Of it's a share pool of configurable configurable resources. Configurable means that settings. Yeah, nice. Every says on on you big. I don't use that mess, it's a big word. I'm IT guys are no English. Let me tell you that. Some other pronounce a word for me. Elvis, oh, wanna pronounce a word for us? I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's ubiquitous. Oh, wow. That's easy. Ubiquitous from anywhere. Ubiquitous means that cloud computing is a model for, for enabling ubiquitous from anywhere. <laughs> you can connect from anywhere. Convenient on demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources. Configurable means that you can take an empty server and you configure it to be a network server. You can take an empty server and you create settings, install things, build applications, and make it a storage server. That's what configurable means. So going forward, we're not going to be saying create a server. We're not going to be using the word create uh, a key pair. We're going to be using the word configure. What's the difference between configure and create? Configure is creating and setting up. I'm about to configure a server, meaning that you're not going to just create a server. You're going to create the server. You're going to install some application. You're going to build a website with it. OK, that's what configure means. While creating is just creating from the console. The AWS console, what we did, we just created an empty server. That's it. But configuring is we're going to connect to this server. We're going to log into the server. We're going to configure things. We're going to install things. We're going to make it into website. That's what configure means. So creating, well, I've created a server now, but that's it. If we're going and connect to it and start installing things and making it into a website, domain name, all these other things, that's when we're now configuring the server. Okay, we're not going to really configure many servers. That's the job of a DevOps engineer. But as an ops guy, you need to know, right, what, what happens, right? Um, okay, any questions so far? I hope I'm not losing anybody. We know what we're doing, right? We're learning clouds. We're not learning clouds and operating systems in various clouds. So that's what we're doing, right? So we're now learning cloud computing, okay? So you can read all these notes. I'll give you cloud computing, what it is, all these extra notes. I'm not, I'm not a great fan of notes, right? I'm a hands-on guy. So but that's what cloud computing is. You get the point, right? So cloud computing is you have public cloud, you have private cloud, you have hybrid, you have community cloud, okay? So these are just the basic characteristics of cloud and the service model, how to deploy them. Public cloud is the one that we all have access to. AWS is public cloud. Amazon is public cloud. Microsoft Azure is public cloud. Google Cloud is public cloud. What is private cloud? It's the one that you don't have. Um, not everyone can just go and buy or create a free account. That's private cloud. For example, VMware. VMware, virtual machineware, is private cloud. This is private cloud. VMware is private cloud. Take note of that. VMware is private cloud because with VMware, you buy your you buy your server and you own it. With AWS or Azure, you're renting. You're renting. It's pay as you go. Let me put it up here. Public cloud. Public cloud is pay as you go. Private cloud is buying and owning and paying monthly. 
That's the difference. On premise, you own it permanently. You go and buy 200 servers that one server costs $30,000, one server equal to $30,000. You buy 200 servers. How much is that? Someone who's good with mathematics in this class? I'm not good at mathematics. How much is that? My heart hurts, by the way. I don't want to do the math. For 300000 Are you sure? Um, um, no, about million. What kind of palm wine you did drink today, man? <laughs> <laughs> Six million dollars, right? So that's the cost that Toyota. That's for ordinary servers. Any kind of, a server is a server. A server is a server. What do you mean by ordinary server? Let's talk about that. A server is a server. What's a server? What's the server? A storage device that's being used to. No, store. no, no, that's not really what the server is. Come on, man. Come on, guys. Let's not do this. What's the server? <laughs> Quasi save the day. You guys wrote it down. Oh man, this is week three, guys. Come on now. What's the server? Ooh. I see you guys are now studying. Quasi save the day. What's the server? Oh boy. A dedicated machine or system used for a specific purpose is what you're you. Yeah. A dedicated machine used for a specific purpose. Chris just said, you guys, I was about to just end class. I want to go home. <laughs> Come on, man. You got to study, man. This is not a joke. This is not your side job. This is not a side hustle. If you make more than $150,000 right now, you shouldn't be here. This is your main thing. If you want to make money, guys, you should take this thing seriously. You need to study an hour a day. If you make more than 150K or more than 110K, then you shouldn't be here. So like, oh, I'm doing AWS on the side. How much do you make today? Because this is going to give you money more than what you make today. I guarantee you. When you have two jobs, you're making $250,000. Or three, you're making $500,000. You're making half a million dollars a year. So this should be your main thing, not your side thing. Most people take it as a side thing. Oh, I'm just doing it on the side. No. Anything that you do in life and you don't put all your power into it doesn't work out. Don't waste your time. Right? Every 7 p.m. you can go watch your shows on Hulu and be happy. People who want to make real money and they put all the 100% effort into this, they succeed. And they become extremely rich. My accidents are extremely rich. I'm talking about driving... She wagons, they bought houses, they installed solar panels in the houses, they're married, have families, they're doing extremely well. So, guys, please don't take this as a side hustle. This is not a side hustle. It's the main thing. So, hard drive is the storage. A server is not a storage device. Hard drive is the storage. This is storage down here. And what else is what else is lacking for the server to be complete? What else is lacking for the server to be complete? Um, memory. Memory. Thank you. At least some people are studying. You know. Guys, please motivate me. Come on, motivation. This is a server. And this server is just an it just has CPU, memory, and storage. You can take this machine right here and turn it into whatever you want to turn it to. You can turn it into a website. You can turn it into a website. You can turn it into an application server. You can turn it into a database server. You can turn it into a network server. You can turn it into a storage server. You can turn it to anything you want to turn it to. You can turn it to a mobile gaming server. A server is just a, a, a enterprise level machine because it, most servers will come with 128 gigabytes of RAM 
that huge amount of size and like, you know, 64 CPUs, right? That's compute power, right? Uh, CPUs, uh, vCPU, because it's a virtual machine. And then we're like 120 terabytes of storage. 120 terabytes of storage. This machine can cost $30,000. This machine with these specifications, let me go there. Let me just do this. Dell.com. Dell cell servers, HP cell servers, HP.com. Just saw enterprise grid servers. This is not something that you want to buy in for, for fun. This is a real product, like, like computer accessories, like uh, a laptop, Dell, gaming, PC accessories, software, workstation. This is for servers. Look at that. Like real huge type of servers, like real machines, right? And this is just the base price. Look at this machine here. Power Edge R760X Rack Server. $32,000, $159. This is, this is a machine. This is what we call a machine. This is what can serve billions of billions of requests, right? Look at the specs of the server. 2.5 chassis with up to eight SAS SATA drives, right? And then you pick your Intel processor, how fast you want it to be, how many caches, all these things. You choose the speed. The more, the more things you choose, the price goes up, the redundancy, everything, right? But this is the base price for an enterprise server. What, look at what they said. This server is ideal for artificial intelligence, for AI. So this is where they can use to train robots. And they can deliver it to you as soon as Tuesday, October 29th. That means when you order a server from Dell, it takes two weeks to come. But this same server, you can see the same server in AWS, and it, it can be available to you immediately. That same type of server, you can go here, and you can look for the instance type, and it will show you like a large server. Look at that. 24x large, 96 vCPU, 106 of memory. And look at, look at how much it costs per hour. $5.64 per hour. So if in one in one month, in one month, this is how calculated. Architects, take note. One in, in IT, one month equals to 750 hours. That's how many hours is in hours in one month. So 750 hours times $5.64. What's that? How much did the math? How much is that our monthly bill going to be in AWS for that one server? Come on, guys. Somebody give me the... About $4,200. $4,200 a month. That's the cost you pay every month. So... If you buy that machine and you start business, and after three months, your business crash, you have spent for this time three months and you're done. But however, if you buy with Best Buy for this price and the business crash after three months, you're stuck with this cost. You're stuck with it. You own it. It came to your house. It came to your office. You own it. So when you buy this machine and it comes to your office, that's when it's called on-premise. Same thing with HP. HP has servers as well. So in your interviews, you're going to be using these names. They're going to ask you, what servers have you worked with? You're going to have to say, work with Power Edge, R76A, XA Rack Server. I will give you guys this stuff to talk about. This shows that you have worked with systems like this. I'm going to create systems like this, using systems like this, right? Using a similar huge instance like this, and you're going to work with it. So you can see how many CPUs is left, how many memory has been used, right? So same thing with HP. HP has servers like that. Very, very... But HP has mostly tower servers. That's a rack server. That's a blade server. This server is called a blade server. This is a blade because it's slim. HP has tower servers. Um, or tower. I call them towers. Towers. That's a, that's, that's a tower server right here. The Z2 Tower Workstation Performance Desktop. 
right? The high, very, very high and expensive type of server. See? 128 gigs of RAM for the 8 terabytes. That's power supply. You choose your specs, choose your specs, and then you click buy. And then you'll come to your office. Okay? So again, that is on-premise. Okay? That is on-premise. Any questions? So again, when you buy on-premise, you own it. You own the physical server that comes to your physically or comes to your office physically. Public cloud is what we're doing. We pay as you go. Monthly payments. Private cloud, public cloud is pay as you go. You don't you don't see the machine, you don't touch it, you don't feel it, you don't own it. Private cloud is um you go to VMware, they sell you a server. That server is permanently yours. The IP address of that server is, is static, is permanent. Guys, give me one second. I'll be right back. One second. I have a delivery at my front door. Homework, guys. Uh, uh -oh. Homework. I'm going to give a homework. Please research the difference between public cloud, private cloud, and on-premise. I think that's the best way. Difference between public cloud, private cloud, and on-premise. That's assignment number one. Assignment number two, research the difference between private IP and public IP. Private IP versus public IP. On-premise versus public cloud versus private cloud. That's assignment number two. And the last one, client versus server. Please provide at least three differences each. Each. Okay? That's the homework. I'll put it in the chat. All right. Cool. So let's continue. So public cloud. Private cloud, hybrid cloud are the, are the various clouds that exist. However, we're going to be working also with public cloud. And then in public cloud, they also have the services that they offer. So this is the deployment models, right? You can deploy your application in hybrid environment. Hybrid means you have public cloud and you have private cloud. That's hybrid, right? Some companies have a VMware, which is VMware is when they serve you servers. They sell you servers. You don't own the servers. You don't, you don't, it doesn't come to you physically, right? With VMware, it doesn't come to you physically, but those servers are reserved for you permanently. Let's say that you want to buy 200 servers. They're going to allocate 200 servers and put it in your own private space in their cloud. What they are doing is very simple. They're taking these physical machines that you see here and putting it in a separate room with a separate network and for that company. For example, T-Mobile wants to, T-Mobile wants private cloud. They don't want public cloud, right? They're gonna take 200 servers, put it in a separate building or a separate rack. It's called, this, this is a rack, a rack. This is what a rack looks like. This is a rack, a server rack. So if you order 200 servers, they're gonna probably get, um, if one rack can take 20 servers, how many racks do you need? 10 racks. They're gonna order 10 racks like this, right? 10 racks, and then put your blade servers in these racks and just store them inside. And put these racks in room two or room 205. Room 205 has a special network which is configured only for T-Mobile. Only T-Mobile can connect to those 200 servers in room 205. So it's like a hotel. And in the hotel, they have room 205, room 206, and 207. So Verizon has bought 
servers and put in room 207. T-Mobile bought their servers and put in room 206. Geico bought their servers and put in room 204. And they have separate internet connections to those rooms. That is private cloud. It's private because the only those servers is connected only to them. They don't own it. They're paying monthly, but it's reserved for them. Private cloud, there's no demarcation. Servers are in a huge hall. And anyone can go online and create one, connect to it, disconnect, delete it, create it. That's the difference. I'm giving you guys the homework already. Because I like you guys so much. Okay, cool. So we, we end up this so when you have hybrid cloud is a combination of both. Let's say you have 50% of the applications running on private cloud on those 200 servers that is privately rack and stack, right? This is called rack and stack. This thing here you see here is rack and stack. When you keep machines in here, it's a rack and stack, right? You rack, you rack your servers and just rack and stack them. Rack servers, servers, right? Like here, yeah, this guy is stressed out because he has to deal with all these servers in this target. You see the cables here. So this one, two, three, four, five racks. Each rack has a rack number. And this five rack might be for, for a company like, you know, Home Depot. This is their rack. So Home Depot, for example, they may not have on-premise. They better have private cloud, right? So these are their servers in here. The internet connection for these five racks is only for Home Depot. Only they can connect to this, this rack, these five racks. And they use these five racks for their server. They can use it for application server rack, storage server rack, network server rack, right? Like that, like that. And then you'll see this, it's going to appear to what we created like this. You have the web server layer rack, application layer rack, database layer rack, right? In those various racks like that, those server racks. Okay, cool. So hybrid cloud, um, Capital One, Capital One uses hybrid cloud. They have 75% in the cloud. They have 25% on-premise. Who wants to tell me why a company will not use cloud 100% and still keep some stuff in private cloud or on-premise? Anybody? Let's see who's thinking. Uh-oh. Guys, you have to be in a quiet place. It takes it to, single point of, to avoid any single point of failure. Uh, not really. Cloud has okay. multiple regions, right? The cloud has regions all over the world, right? Um, okay. AWS cloud regions. If you look at the cloud regions all over the world, you see an image here. Um, it's spread geographically all over the world. If you open this up, you see they have Ohio, Oregon, California. They have Gulf Cloud. They have Virginia, London. Frankfurt. So you cannot say to have what is single point of they have regions all over the world. This is AWS only. And if you look at Azure, Azure have regions all over the world as well. Um, you see this one here. Azure has regions in Oklahoma and Iowa, South Central, they have in Brazil, you know, they have nothing in Africa, they have India and all these things, uh, UK, Canada. So you cannot say it's for a single point of failure. Why would a company not run all of its applications in on the cloud? Why would it run want to keep some on-premise? Anybody? Just take a wild guess. There's no correct answer or wrong for answer. For safety purpose. True. When someone controls your servers, there is a safety issue. What else? That's a good one. Safety, security concerns because backups. Mm, yes, if the cloud goes down in the east region, or let's say Google systems go down, then what happens to you that right? But you know, there's something it's an agreement between you and Google Cloud for your data security. There's, there's a contract agreement, so Google will have to pay you some money for the loss. Yes, what else? I'm looking for the main one. There's a main thing. Why? Cost. Mm -hmm. The you know. the cloud is the cloud is operating the expense. The cloud is pay as you go. On premises, um, on premises, it's you own it, right? It's capex. On premises capital expenditure. Wow, while, while Cloud is operating expenses. Let me talk about that. This is for architects. For those who want to become architects. So when you own when you own servers. 
on premise that is called capital expenditure. What does this mean? In America, when you own when you own assets, because servers are servers and assets, it's physical, you can touch it as an asset. When you own assets, you do pay taxes. Oh, okay. To the government, <laughs> right? So Wells Fargo owns a huge data center or a server center in Iowa that costs $30 million. Wells Fargo owns that. So they pay taxes to the government on that $30 million of property. It's like property taxes, right? But if you rent servers like cloud, right? If you don't own, just rent servers monthly, like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, it's called operating expenses. And guess what? Do you pay taxes on operating expenses? No. No taxes paid. And your costs will be $21 million a month. Or $21 million a month. Or I don't know, all year. Or forever, for lifetime. I don't know. But there is a considerable cost savings using cloud over that. But there is an advantage of why some companies don't use the cloud. I'll give you an example. Why does Walmart not use the cloud? Why does Target not use AWS cloud? Come on, guys. Business, think of business. I may see like... Uh... Privacy, um, not okay. to expose yourself to the physical, competition. Physical stores and sales and and what does Amazon do? What does Amazon do? Sure. Amazon, Amazon does what? Sells items, right? What does yeah. Walmart do? Sells what? Um, sells items. Okay, so why would Amazon not? Why would Walmart not use Amazon Cloud? Oh, yes. okay. Yes. Exactly. Yes, what does Target do? What does Target do? Target.com. What do they do? They sell items too. So why are they not using Amazon Cloud? Because Amazon Cloud can use that as a competitive advantage over them. If Walmart uses Amazon, Amazon can do some stuff and say, oh, Walmart, your servers have crashed. Walmart goes down on Christmas Day. And Walmart and Amazon, people can buy at Amazon on that Christmas Day because Walmart is down. So Walmart, Target, Best Buy, all these companies, bestbuy.com, have vowed not to use AWS again because AWS did mistakenly crash their servers. It was a mistake. But they took it, took it, they took it as a personal thing and said, you're trying to crash our system so you can sell laptops and electronics over us. So these guys now use, you guessed it, private cloud. Because VMware is not in competition with them. VMware doesn't sell the same assets or items as them. So they have no competition. But AWS. Is in competition with Walmart, Target, Best Buy. Now, the reason why Capital One has 25% on premise because of regulations. Regulations. In America, you have something called FINRA, Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, requires all financial companies in America to have at least 25% of their data and assets on premise. It's a financial regulation. So they have to maintain that. If everything is in the cloud, they are prone to security risk. The cloud has not been 100% um, declared secured by the government. 
That's why you see in roles like security, cloud security engineers are very in high demand right now because the cloud is not very secure. So we have to really secure the cloud. The government themselves doesn't really use the cloud today. The government doesn't use the cloud today. The government still uses on-premise. So they have required all financial institutions to keep at least 25% of their infrastructure and resources and servers on-premise. However, Capital One is the only company that is heavily, heavily, heavily on AWS. They have 75% of their stuff on AWS, and that's why they're able to create advanced applications, faster applications, things like that. You have JP Morgan Chase as well, Chase Bank, it's also in the cloud. The companies like Wells Fargo, they're still very behind. Wells Fargo is still very much behind because they don't want to move to the cloud so that it's not this cost of $30 million paying taxes to the government, additional money. That's why Wells Fargo charges high banking fees than Capital One or Chase Bank because they have a high cost. Any questions? Mm, okay. You see how we're not mixing business and real life, and this is companies make these decisions because of what they're really, really facing. If you apply for a job at Capital One, you have a high chance of getting that job because you know cloud. If you apply for a job at Wells Fargo, you don't have a high chance of getting that job because it's all on-premise. Home Depot, on-premise. Wells Fargo, on-premise. Lois, on-premise. Best Buy, private cloud. Walmart, private cloud. Target, private cloud. AutoZone, private cloud and, cl and cloud hybrid. So these are all things that you need to be able to aware of. Um, US government, private cloud on-premise. CDC, private cloud. FDA, private cloud. CIA, on-premise. FBI, private cloud, on-premise. Okay, so the, not everyone uses the cloud today. Okay, they don't, they don't trust it. So start the FBI, they don't trust it. Cool. So in the cloud or any of these models, you have software as a service. So they do offer software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. The ones that we're gonna be working with mostly are these two, platform and infrastructure, okay? And like I said, it's a pooled resource sharing. Like I said, in the cloud, you're sharing resources. Mostly they share a lot in the public cloud. In private cloud, you don't really share. They share the building, but they don't share the racks. Each customer has his own rack. Right, and then there's network connections of wild coverage. There's rapid ex elastic extensions. They meet that payment services, like I said, again, in the cloud, private or public cloud or hybrid, you're paying as you go. So it's meta, there's meta. There's a meta that is, is you know, one hour, two hour, three hours, tracking the hours. And also you also have on-demand services as well. Oh, what is this thing? Okay. So that's cloud computing. You see, you have the cloud computing, internet, and then you have services. I'm gonna skip all that. You can read that for yourself. So the characteristics of cloud computing is uh, ubi ubiqui ubiquitous <laughs> network from anywhere, from anywhere network access, resource pooling, rapid elasticity. It means in the cloud, you can scale. You can go from two CPU to four CPUs within two minutes. You can just add, add the size. It's flexible pricing. It's pay as you go, it's pay per use. If you don't use it, you don't pay for it, right? Then you have this on-demand self-service. Because self-service means you can go, go into AWS and create it for yourself. You don't have to need anybody's help to do that, okay? Like this one we have here is running right now. So, okay. We'll do some hands-on work after our break. So let's just continue going. So cloud computing is for everyone, you know? Cloud computing. Some examples that uses that uses cloud computing today. You have Facebook, Twitter, online gaming, Gmail Box, Dropbox, and then for businesses, they have these applications called customer relationship management, backup services. They have enterprise relationship planning. Uh, so applications that use cloud computing. They have financial applications that use cloud computing, like Capital One mobile banking app, Geico mobile app. They use cloud computing. So for deployment models, you have private cloud, which is internal, it's private. Then you have the public cloud here in the cloud. And then hybrid is private and public. 
So some companies own VMware and also own servers and AWS as well. The new applications that they are very, very comfortable building in the cloud, they'll put in AWS. Applications that they want to be confidential, that they're not very sure about the cloud, they'll leave it in VMware, which is on-premise. And then off-premise is something else. So you have private, public, and community, and hybrid cloud. Make sure you speak on hybrid. We'll get to that. We're doing interviews. We'll touch on hybrid cloud because it's a, it's a big, big thing. Like I said, no company is 100% in the cloud. I don't know any company 100% in the cloud, except for like Uber. Uber was born in the cloud, and they don't have any regulation for them to stay on premise. So they're just born in the cloud, right? They're Lyft was born in the cloud, DoorDash, born in the cloud, um, Uber Eats, born in the cloud. Those companies that are brand new, they are doing extremely well. They don't have any servers. They make a lot of money. And you know they have offices in Dallas, Austin, New York, but they don't have any servers. So that's another thing too. Um, Tesla is private cloud. They don't trust the cloud. Elon Musk doesn't trust AWS. I mean, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos were competing for the number one richman in the world. So he will not use AWS because it's going to make Jeff more richer than him. So he's not going to buy his servers or rent his servers. So, so same thing with Facebook. Facebook didn't buy from AWS servers, right? They have their own private cloud. So, All right. Well, just another name for data center, right? It resides on a private network that runs on the part of data center that's usually used by one organization, owned and managed by organization like itself, a third party information too. So as third party here is VM is third party here is VMware, the manager for you, support organizations, business objectives, and economic sound way. It has high security, compliance, legislation, and regulations, like FINRA regulations. I'm using the word FINRA because I'm gonna put it on your resume, right? The uh, the regulations you need to know are you have FINRA, um, you have HIPAA, compliance, right? Um, health insurance, whatever they act, you have um uh, PCI, uh, DSS compliance, right? All this is being your resume. You have NIST compliance. Um, you have ISO 27001 uh, compliance. All this compliance is being your resume, right? These are all things that you need to um, have on your resume or know that you have worked with systems that meet this compliance. For example, ISO 9000 is that build systems, build applications that meets customer focus, that is for our leadership, engagement of people, process approach, improvement and evidence of basic decision making. Meaning that this application that you're building, people are gonna use it to make decisions. For example, you know, um, Power BI reporting tool or, you know, or WhatsApp communication, you know, that you build a system that have a purpose this organization right here, this um, standard makes force companies to build things that meet these standards, right? There's a standard that you have to meet. So all this to be in your resume, okay? Cool. Public cloud delivery off-site service, uh, su service over the internet is sharing of resources. It's multi-tenancy, meaning that it's a lower level of security and privacy, right? Multi-tenancy means that you're sharing the cloud with other people. Yes, you're sharing the cloud with other people. AWS Cloud is in a house on a building in North Virginia. And in that building, this is T-Mobile Servers. This, this is an example. T-Mobile Servers is here. Um, Bank of America servers are here. And then you have, um, you know, New York Stock Exchange servers are here. They're all in the same building. So if New York Stock Exchange is running some process, that's getting very hot. It's getting very hot. And the heat of this server can affect the servers, right? Because in the same building, the AC is on, but the heat of this server affects servers as well, right? And then when this server is using too much internet or too much bandwidth, right? Too much bandwidth, what do they call this? They call it noisy neighbor. Noisy neighbor. 
when, when one server is doing using too much internet connection or too much resources in this building, which is AWS building in North Virginia, we call this guy a noisy neighbor. And how would they know the noisy neighbor? Bank of America will be experiencing issues, whereas they're not, they're not doing anything. They'll complain to AWS, AWS investigate that whole building or rack and see who is consuming the most bandwidth on internet, internet bandwidth or internet speed. And they say, oh, it's New York City, they suck this guy's noisy neighbor. Then they might have to remove him to a different building because he's a noisy neighbor. So there'll be no, there'll be no noise anymore. This is a quiet environment, you see? But they mostly keep financial institutions in the same environment and communication guys in the same environment because they all do similar things. Okay? T Mobile. Any questions, guys? Because they're quiet today. Wow. Okay, cool. Oh, we go public cloud. Then you have community cloud, it's just a shared private cloud, right? No one really owns it, it's free. Um, it's used for educational research. Most of the universities, uh, right, have the community cloud. Then you have hybrid cloud. It's a mix of the above models, combining several private and public cloud solutions from several products into one IT infrastructure. So you combine VMware and AWS into one infrastructure. That's hybrid cloud. Take note of hybrid cloud, guys. They'll ask you in the interview. It's an interview question. Take note of this. It's an interview question. What is hybrid cloud? In fact, let's add it to the assignment. What is hybrid cloud? What is hybrid cloud? Add it to the assignment. What is hybrid cloud? Add it to the assignment. What is hybrid cloud? What is hybrid cloud? Okay. Cool. So hybrid cloud is, you know, specific services. You can add security from on, from private, privacy from private, and then compliance from cloud. You can mix it. You can mix your goals. So this is pretty much it. You have private, it's a single tenant implementation. You own it. You see your you own it operated by an organization or a third party for you. You can define your own data management policies, it's self-service and automation capabilities provide agility for you. Hybrid is a combination of the two. Public is multi-tenant. It's owned and operated by service provider, which is AWS. You're bound by multi-tenancy data management policies. And then it's also self service as well. So what are the disadvantages of each cloud? Private cloud, you have security and control. You have customization because you control it, you own it in some form. You have legacy infrastructure. But it's not scalable. When you buy servers from VMware, you buy 200 servers, that's it. If you want more, you have to make a request. It's called a purchase order. It goes to your financial budgeting. If it's not budgeted for that year, you have to wait till next year. So the ability to scale, add more servers, is bounded by budget, time, the purchase order, which is other approval, manager approval, all these things. You make a request to VMware. VMware has to create the servers, transport it to the rack, put it in the rack, connect it, connect it to you. So scalability is... And then another disadvantage is the CapEx investment. When you do private cloud, you own it, so you pay property taxes. Property taxes is based on your county. When you leave, um, I think in Iowa, then one county is a very expensive county. It's about 2.5% taxes yearly in Des Moines. So Wells Fargo pays 2.5% of $13 a year for their CapEx taxes. 24 by 7 operations is not possible because no one is in those data centers 24-7, right? No one is sleeping there. There's only one security guard at the front door who is guarding the building, but that's about it. No one, it's really, there's nobody in this building. It's just there. It's just a bunch of servers and AC and cooling. That's all. When if something goes wrong, someone comes there once a month and check the connection and go, no one stays in this building, it's empty. So you don't really have 24 seven operations, right? 
So with hybrid cloud, you have this manage uh, services, some for AWS managing some services for you, I'm something on so mix of both. You have security and control. You have some scalability from the cloud. You know a little bit of both. You have twenty four by seven support from AWS and also maybe from your company as well. You have service level agreements, um, but you don't have the ability to innovate because you're still dealing with issues from on premise. You cannot really innovate. Then you also have process flow procedures. Like I said, you have so much processes that you have to follow. For example, if you want to connect your private on-prem to the cloud, that's both on procedures and process. And also you're, you're limited by global presence. Um, in like, for example, Wells Fargo only has servers in them when that's their only, they don't, they don't have a backup. So they, they cannot do business in Russia or Japan because they don't have servers there. Whereas if they had AWS, they can deploy their banking applications in China and have used an AWS region in China. So that's another advantage. They don't have a global presence. When you have only public cloud, you have massive scalability. You can create servers as quick as possible. There's a lot of innovation. You have a lot of service on demand. However, there's no security or privacy because you are in a public cloud and you can experience noisy neighbor. Data location. Your location is stored in some other person's building. And if you are regulated by the government, like the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ market in New York, they don't want you to have customer financial accounts in a region outside of America. There is a regulation called GDPR. Okay, homework, guys. Go look at all these regulations, man, because it's not, a, it's not important, but it'll be on your resume because they need to know that you know these regulations um, before you can work on systems. GDPR is regulations that say it's a European Union because of Mark Zuckerberg that created some Facebook thing that people did out there. Was, Facebook was selling data to, selling your data to people. So the European Union created GDPR so that every application that runs in Europe, the data will stay in Europe. It was created in 25th of May, 2018. So, all those Facebook, Amazon.uk, Amazon.fr, Amazon.ge, Amazon in Germany, the data lives in Germany. It stays within the boundaries of the European Union Commission. This is what GDPR, GDP, GDPR means or is for. Same thing, there are some regulations that say that US data, financial and healthcare, especially HIPAA, the data cannot leave the United States. There's something called no data expectations allowed. So if you're going to create an application for a hospital, the server must reside within the boundaries of the United States. That is the law. So no, 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 but said that, oh, it's, we have cheaper servers in the UK. No, the server must live within the United States. Okay. So the regulations that you have to know. So again, data location is very important here, right? And then support services, um, also, also another one that is a disadvantage. You won't really have much support because it's public cloud. You don't have a personal person to be helping you. When you have an issue, you open up a case with AWS, they might not get to you on time and, you know, things like that, because it's just, it's a public. So it's, it's the, the treat case is based on first come, first serve. So the seven models you have, you have these various size models. You can read about it. It's not very important. It's not very important. You can read more about it. Like I said, again, you have infrastructure services. You have the Windows Azure Virtual Machine and networks, which we're about to create and see. So we're going to be managing a lot of the infrastructure and platform. Okay, those two things. Infrastructure is the the empty, the empty servers that we're going to create, and then the platform is the servers that we're going to take servers install things, configure the servers, and it becomes a platform. So an empty infrastructure is just an empty server that we're going to create. That's an infrastructure. Server is part of the force on that infrastructure, right? It's empty, just empty server. That's it, right? And then with storage, right? And then platform as a service, we'll take the empty server, and we install things, configure things like databases, uh, development tools like Napa, 
create applications on there. Now it becomes a platform, database platform, application platform, web server platform. So these tools are going to focus on. The SaaS is things like SharePoint, Microsoft Office 365, Outlook. We're not going to focus on those things a lot. Again, our cloud clients, again, client and servers, these are the servers down here. Software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. Our cloud clients are what? Our apps, WhatsApp app, Firefox, browsers, Firefox, and mobile phones are also considered clients. Okay? Uh, we'll take a break in two minutes. That's us. You can read. You can read more about these things, guys. I don't want to go through them. You can read them. Read them. So, software as a service is things like Gmail. We're not going to focus on Gmail, right? That's a software as a service. You just use it. You don't configure it. You don't monitor it. Google manages it. We're not going to focus on that because it's it's just a service where you just use. That's it. We cannot do anything with it. However, Windows Azure, Google App Engine, AWS EC2, we're going to focus on it. Same thing here, Amazon services, okay? And you can remember about these things. This, inter this question comes in your interview to explain the SaaS model, platform model, model, the PaaS model, or the IIS model, right? You can explain them. Again, infrastructure is the servers, the network, the storage, the data center fabric, the firewall, the low balancers. Platform is when you take the servers and you convert them to database. Java runtime, you know, application runtime, anywhere. Without infrastructure, you cannot have platform. It's a building block. You use infrastructure to build a platform. And then you use a platform to build a software. Okay? So software is like emails, industrial applications. CRM is like Salesforce. ERP is like NetSuite. HR is like ADP systems, um, Workday systems, right? It's a software as a service. So we, DevOps engineers take infrastructure, build them into a platform and then developers come into the platform and build the software. What do SREs do? We monitor platform and infrastructure. We don't monitor the actual application itself because it's already out there to be used. Again, this is a class seven comparison. This is on-premise. In on-premise, you manage all these things. On-premise, when you own your servers, you manage your network, your storage, your servers, everything. Virtualization, the operating system, the middleware, the runtime, the data applications, everything. When you go to the cloud, like AWS Cloud, they manage a network for you, the storage, the servers, the virtualization, part of the operating system, the manager for you, like one we just created today, right here. And connect to this server. The manager for us. Right? Oh, let's see. We just connect to it. And here, you name dash A. It's a Linux server. Linux server, or right, Linux. So, but we have to maintain this operating system on this server. This is a Linux operating system server. See, in Linux 23. We have to update it. We have to patch it. We have to maintain it. You know how your i your i your phones you have to run an uh, an update iOS update on your phones the same thing here, right? iPhone will release the update on your phone, and then you go Apple will release the update on your phone, and then you go update it. Same thing here, Amazon will release the update, and then we go update the operating system. How do we do it? Like this, simple, sudo yum update. So the yum update dash y. Okay, it's already up to date. We don't have to do anything. Okay, so that's how you update the servers. And so then now we manage part of the operating system, the middleware, the runtime, the data, and the applications. These are the things that you have to install to create a platform. These things, middleware, runtime, data, and applications. Then here in platform, we only manage the data and the applications because the infrastructure engineers have already created all these things. Platform engineers have to only manage two things, the application and the data, that's it. And then with this, the developers come on this layer and build a software and 
boom, deliver as a service. You don't have to manage anything on the software as a service. These question comes in the interview. What is the difference between traditional IT, IAS, PAS, and SAS? It comes in the interview. And with that, we'll take a break. Questions. So this instance of creating the AWS and Amazon Web Services, we're gonna go terminate it. Make sure you always terminate your instances, right? Always terminate when you're done practicing. Always terminate it, right? Make sure they always terminate. So it's gonna it's shutting down. Then it's gonna delete the instance. Okay. <clears throat> now we're gonna to go to Azure. Everyone log into your Azure portal. Portal.azure.com. Portal.azure.com. If you have created an Azure account, you go ahead and log in. I'm gonna do it the first time alone to show you guys. Then let me log in again. So I bookmarked it here. Quick start. I was able to log in. See? After Skygate, I I'll look, I'll let it log into my account. Okay, Microsoft account. Is everyone able to log into your Azure account? Let's see. Let me get a verbal. Yes, that's another one on my page. Or oh, yes. Does everyone have Azure? Guys, you need to be, huh? Yes. 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 Okay, log in. Log in, guys. Sorry, sorry. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna demonstrate it. Please just watch. After I do it, then everyone does it. Then we're gonna go home. Sounds good? Cool. When you log into Azure, it look like this. Does everyone have this page? This is called the landing page, right? Yours might look a little different because you don't have resources. I have resources. I have Databricks. I have all these yes, things. All that cut down there is. Exactly. So you might not have anything, right? I have resources. Right. So, so when the first thing you get into AW into Azure, if you go to the left hand side, let's talk about this dashboard right here. If you compare the two, go back there, AWS has way more services or resources than, than, than any other cloud. If you look at AWS services, you have lots of services. If you click on that here, you have this, this, it's so many of them. Machine learning, AI, so many. Whereas Azure doesn't have many. This is all they have. You have Application services, functions, databases, virtual machines, low balancer, storage, networks, Microsoft Entry ID, right? And then resources. So if you can all their resources, this is all they have. This is my resources that I've created in the past. Go back home, go back here, click on home, dashboard, you can see here of my dashboard, my prior dashboard. But again, all services in Azure. This is it, category, service name. So on that computes, they have these services. Infrastructure as a service, you see that? They have platform as a service. So if you wanna create infrastructure, you come and create these things here. You wanna create a platform, you create these platforms here. That's a powerful thing with um, Azure, okay? Now, one of the very unique differences between Azure and AWS is what? Azure is SOC 2 compliance. One of the very key differences, AWS versus Azure. Azure is SOC 2 compliance. Again, I'm giving you guys this compliance because if, you, if you're gonna become an architect, 
you need to know all these compliance regulations. FINRA, I'm going to list that. If you want to be an architect, we can speak in, in on the side. Um, architects is a, you know is a high is a is a promotion to an engineer or to an SRE. GDPR, um, SOC compliance, uh, PCI, uh, PCI, DSS, um, FINRA. Uh, you have HIPAA. Uh, which I think is double P, right? HIPAA. And then um, GDPR, SOC, PCI, ISO 9001, ISO 27001, 27001. All these regulations you need to know if you're going to be an architect. Because as architecture, we design systems that engineers go build. So we need to design systems with these regulations in mind. If the regulation says data is leaked within the United States, then it means that we need to build the application such that only users within the United States can connect to it. That means that the client's IP address and or IP address allocation needs to be bounded by the zip codes of the United States. That's how architects think. So you can go look up these regulations. I put them in the chat. It's your homework. If you want to be an architect, but if not, you don't, it doesn't really matter, All right? So cool. So when you land in Azure for the very first time, I'm just showing you the dashboard, right? You're going to see all your services. Everything is there. It looks cool. So we want to do compute. The compute service has, you know, servers, right? Availability says all these things. But our server that we want to create from scratch and then log into it and, and configure it is called a virtual machine. That's it. A virtual machine is what they call it. I created one four hours ago, you can see. So, but when you come here, go home, create a resource right here. Create a resource. And then you will see this bot and then you click on create virtual machine. And then when you log in, you always see that the very first, so you see that's a very, that's the base cost. You want to see the cost details. The base cost is eighty dollars because it's an Ubuntu server twenty two point zero four long term support. That's the size of the server. A DS two D two S V three. That's the disk of the server. Thirty two gigabytes premium disk, and the network and everything is zero 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 zero, right? So a month, you say about cost you eighty eighty dollars and thirty thirty cents a month. They're really showing you the cost. So. You will see this Azure subscription V1. This is like your billing account number. So in that account, you want to create a resource group. This is how you're able to differentiate your different business units within the company, like marketing departments, human resource departments, different, different resource groups. So when you come in here, you want to create a resource group right here. You're going to call the resource group. Uh, my first RG resource group. I'm going to click OK. OK. And now you want to give the virtual machine a name. You can call it my first virtual server or machine. All right. A server is a machine. And you look at the region. The region here is US Central, Central US, which is Oklahoma. I just know it's Oklahoma, right? Because Central US is Oklahoma. You have South Africa, no, you have Central India, you have Germany, Italy, Norway, Poland, Spain. But you want to choose the closest one next to you. By default, based on your IP address, it will choose the closest one next to you. So I'm in Dallas, so Oklahoma is closest to me. So it choose Oklahoma. Okay, I leave everything default. Zone one, so they have many many zones in each region. So if you want it to be in through thro all three zones, you can select that. But want it to be just in one zone, we'll leave it as it is. Security type, you have the standard, you have trusted, and you have confidential. 
we don't want any kind of security because we want to be able to connect to it. But on the job, if if you're creating a web application or a website, you use trusted launch virtual machines. If you're creating a database or application server, you use confidential, right? So here we'll just take standard because we want to connect to it. And then now we'll just have to choose our operating system. The operating system that we'll choose, these are the options that we have. You have Ubuntu Linux, you have Oracle Linux, you have Red Hat, you have Debian, you have Windows Server 2019. We have all these, all these options. But now we'll focus on Linux, right? We created Linux in um, AWS. So here, let's do Ubuntu. So we don't always, we don't always don't want to do the most recent uh, operating system because recent applications or software always have bugs. So here we're going to take 22.04. Okay. And then here, the VM architecture, we always want to choose x64. You don't want to choose ARM64. ARM64 is AMD processors. They're not very resilient. You want to always do x64. Intel, x64. The size of the machines are the sizes. Um, you have the standard DSV3, two CPUs, eight memory, $80 a month. That's the lowest size. You can click on to see more sizes. Um, so one CPU and RAM, right? And I have size of sizes, DS1, right? Um, you can close this here and go back. And we'll just choose the basic one, two CPUs, eight gigs of memory, right? We're going to delete it. So we're not even going to get to hours where we can be charged. Even, even 25 cents per month, we're not going to get, to, we're not going to get there. So we're going to choose that one. And then how do we want to connect to it? We want to connect using public key. Never use a password. Never, ever, ever use a password, right? We want to use a public key. The username is Azure user. That's the default username. And we're going to generate a key pair. Generate a key pair. And I'm going to call this key pair. Debo key pair. We we'll call it your name. If you wanted to create, if you want to create spaces between this word for this word. You can use something like Debo underscore key underscore right underscore first. You can say first underscore key pair. So whenever you want to create spaces in your names, use the underscore character. Why? Because in IT, if you just do it like this, there will be spaces in your names. You see, you see it cannot contain spaces. So you have to use the underscore character. Because when you want to go use a terminal like this, and you want to like do like to list it, it will, it will appear like this. And so the server cannot tell if this is one word or this is three separate words. So if you use an underscore, the server will be able to differentiate and say, oh, this is one word this is one word not three words because you have that, that the join with this underscore okay it's a little it's a little secret there now select the ports that we want to connect to we want to select http https just right just want to connect to the servers next thing is a disk choose your disk we'll leave it as the default right It comes to the default disk, right? That's this. This this is the this side. This default one. So leave it as that. Default network. Um. Default inbound ports. Will allow this port to come in, right? It's gonna give it a public IP address. And then load balancing none. Next management. Leave it as it is. Next is. Monitoring, leave it the default. Then next is the tags. You want to give it a name here, like name, like Ebo, virtual, dash machine. So either underscore or dash, but here you want to use dash, right? Play around with it, see what works, see what doesn't work. Okay, that's how you learn. Review and create, it's going to run a validation test. Validation has passed, create server. 
download that private key that we just created. Download it. I'm going to download the key and save it to my the now is deploying. And that's it. You have deployed your first Azure server under the My First Resource Group in Microsoft. So Linux VM, right? It's creating the VM right now. All you can do is go home and go to virtual machines and you'll see this there, right there. My virtual server is being created. So right there, creating. So that one is running right now. I want to terminate this one so I don't get charged. Let's delete that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, so deployment succeeded. Deployment succeeded. I was able to create it. Deployment means created, creating and configuring as well, right? So these words are used interchangeably. Or well, I want to deploy a server. That means I want to create a server. Okay. So deployment, create, configure, similar meanings. So I'm going to select a server. I'm going to, I'm going to terminate it. Delete it. Apply, false, delete. 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 False delete means that even if someone is connected to the server, it will bootstrap their connection and terminate the server. That's what false delete means. Any questions? Are we able to go and create a, a, a server now on our own? Are we able to create an Azure VM on our own? Or do I need to walk through it again? Can you walk through it one more time? Sure. Of course. Cool. So where do you want to start? I go home. Is everybody here? Yes. Or do we want to do it together? It's up to you guys. We can do it together. Okay. Is everyone logged in here? Yes? No? Maybe? Someone needs to yes. I mean, Okay. I need to just get yes from anybody, then we'll go forward. Okay. First things first. Click on create a resource. Okay. Hold on first. Guys, yeah, stop, stop, stop. Hold on. Let's do the right way. Let's do the way that you're going to do on the job. First things first, when you go into Azure, the very first thing you need to create is a resource group. A resource group is like uh uh, a logical area where you want to group things. You want to put all your resources in that group. So when you, if you want all the resources to be under the production group or marketing group, then you're going to create a group where all the resources for that group, for that department will be in that group. This is because when the bill comes, they can see which department or which person is consuming what resource or how much they just spent because they belong to their that resource or, or service they created is in that group. So first things first, when you land in Azure, Microsoft Azure portal, you'll see this. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Now, everyone click on resource groups. Everybody click on resource group. We're going to create a resource group. Click on resource group. Hey, what's happening? Everyone click on resource group. And then when, you, when you're here, click on create new resource group. Create new resource. Take note, your resource group is region specific. Your resource group is region specific. You see here that default region is East US, but I'm in where? I mean, Central. So I'm going to look for Central US. So if you're in the East Coast, you can use East, East US. If you're in the West Coast, you can use right the West US. But I'm in Central. 
I'm going to click use what is closest to me. So resource group, going to call this my first cloud S-R-E-R-G. Does this name look nice? Or do we, should we use underscores? Let me see what, if you... What, underscores. Right? There you go. My underscore first underscore cloud underscore SRE underscore resource group. So my first cloud SRE resource group. That's the name. Capish, to the morning, see. We good, everybody here? Yes, yes. All yes. right. Review and create. Review. When you actually review and create, it, it does a validation check to make sure that everything everything is co checked correctly, everything is done correctly. Then you do create, and that's it. You have created your first resource group in Azure. What the hell is wrong with me? Azure, you have to know resource groups and VMs and stuff. Okay. Now that we're creating a resource group, we can now go back home. Go home and click on create a resource. Create a resource. Create a resource and then on that create resources, we can create virtual machine. Right? When you click on create virtual machine on that resource group, click the down arrow and look for your resource group that you just created. So this is my first cloud SRE. I'm gonna select that. Then give your virtual machine a name. I'm gonna call mine um. Um, I don't know what to call my virtual machine name. I'm going to call Debo underscore betting server. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Linux VMs may only contain letters dash and dash. So here, they don't allow underscore, but they allow dash. Mm, okay. We're learning something. Look at that. This is typical in IT, guys. Some places they'll allow underscore, like resource group creation, but virtual name creation, they don't allow underscore. Because it's a server name. And this server name is going to be used somewhere else like it is. But this one, underscore is okay here, yeah, it's not okay. Take note, the small, 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 small details like that are very important, okay? That's my server name. I'm in Central US region, which is Oklahoma. Um, leave everything as default, leave everything as it is. But when it comes to the image, we're gonna change the image to 22.04 Ubuntu server, 22.04 LTS, X64 Gen 2. Make sure this is X84 checked. So and does this apply when you are working or this is just for learning purpose? What do you mean? What's, I don't understand your question. I mean, like, let's say you, you are, assume that you are in a company, you want to create yes. Trump, yes. choose the same um, um, image. No. Whenever you're asked to create a server in a company, they'll give you, they'll give you specifications and requirements. Okay. This is just, right now I'm just learning, right, Ben? You will ask the requester who will request the server. What operating system version do you want? What operating system do you want? Do you want Linux? Do you want Windows, right? If it's Windows, do you want Windows Server 2002? You ask all these questions. It'll be in the ticket. You don't even need, you don't need to ask. It'll be in the, the service now ticket. Okay? Yep. Yeah, it'll be in the service now ticket. Everything in the ticket. You just go open the ticket and you, you deploy the ticket. Right?
I'm not seeing a central US online at the section or region. Um, click that, click on region, click down, and just type central. It should come up. Right, central US is right there. Nope. Are you in Dallas? <laughs> yes, I'm not seeing central. I'm seeing central India, Korea, central, Canada, central. Nice. Do you want to share your screen? Okay. Yeah. Um. So it's up there. Select the Ubuntu. You your name is your server name is not it's not best practice. Isabel server, right? It's not best practice. What do you do? Dash. Mm -hmm. I, I first of all I put a dash it uh I have this uh but no it cannot end with a dash. You have to complete the name. Right? Okay. There you go. You see that? Okay, scroll down. Scroll down. And then now you're going to choose the image. We're doing Ubuntu Server 22.04. Imagining that we're using our ServiceNow ticket that was given to us, 22.04. Yes. Make sure you check the ticket. The ticket says 22.04. You will choose 22.04. If they did not specify the operating system in the ticket, guess what? You have to reach out to the requester of that ticket and say, hey, Sir, ma'am, you forgot to attach the um type of server you the operating system you wanted. Which one did you refer to? Can you update the ticket? Thank you. That's communication. You have to communicate this. Don't if it tells you over over chat that like, oh Ubuntu 22.4, telling hey, please can you update the ticket for record keeping purposes? So select 22.04. Also, too, they'll also tell you the size that they want as well. Scroll down. The size, they'll tell you, oh, we want two CPUs. They'll not tell you that they want standard DS2. They don't know what standard D2S is. They don't know. They just know that, oh, this application is going to be a marketing application that we want to connect it to TikTok and Facebook to do some marketing for us, a custom marketing. So we need a server that is two CPU, eight memory. That's all. So you will come here and click down, click there, click the arrow and look for a server that is two CPU and eight memory. And because you work for that company, you also want to be very cost conscious. And you choose the first one, standard D2, that's it. Administration account, authentication type. How do you authenticate to this server? Using SSH public key. Okay, scroll down. That's a username for the server. You're going to generate, generate new key pair. You see, it gave you a key, a name there already. It's a bear dash key. You can give it a custom name if you want. You can leave that name. So give it a key pair name, or you can use that if you want. The key pair name right there, down there. Not there. Nope. Next, right, right there. You can use that. Set, leave that name, or you can give it a, a different name. It's up to you. Okay. Okay. Next thing down is the network. Scroll down. Selected inbound ports, click on the down arrow. You want to check HTTPS and HTTP. You want to always check Can this. Can I uncheck this? No, 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 no. Okay. You want to check all these methods because so that when you create an application or something on this server, it can, um, it can and it will, um, you can connect to the browser. Let's say you want to connect to your Firefox browser, right? You'll be able to connect to this, right? So, okay. So scroll down. That's all. That's all. That's all? Mm -hmm. so, no, 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 no. Next disk. Next, next disk. We're leaving this. We're not going to add any new, more disk because it really has disk attached to it. Next, networking. We're making sure that it has a public IP. That's it. You'll have a public IP. The public IP will be called Isabel Server IP, right? The public inbound ports is that we've chosen those ports. Yeah. Next is management. We're going to leave it as this. We're not enabling anything, right? Next is okay. Yeah, everything is default. Default. Next oh. is monitoring. 
this is a uh, monitoring. We're not going to do anything. It's, it's, it came, monitoring comes by default. You see, it's come by default. So boot statistics enabled with manual storage account is really by there by default. So next, advanced. Any extensions, any applications that you wanted to custom build, wide application, the server has been built, you put here. Any scripts that I want to run while the application is the server is in build will run here. Right. The next tags. Here we're going to give it a name. So in a, on that name, type name, and then value, give it a, a friendly name that you're going to remember. This is a friendly name that you're going to not the server name, but a friendly name that you can remember. That you, know you created that server. And value. Any name that you like. Maybe not value. Yeah, anything that you like. Uppercase, lowercase, whatever you like. Okay. No, no, don't do anything else. That's it. Click next, review and create. It runs the validation check to make sure everything is correct. This is the validation is checking. You see the cost there? 0 0.1100 oh, no. per hour. So that's the cost per hour. So it's running your validation check right now. Then you'll give you the permission to create it. Why is this low? Uh, maybe it's your internet. Oh. Validation passed, and then now create. I hope everyone is following these steps, right? Yes. Download your private key pair and create resource. Yes. Everyone created a server in Azure. No, mine failed for some reason. Uh, you may have put some fake credit card in your account. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was. Yeah. You, you know. You know. Microsoft don't play, man. They want to make sure that after one year of free trial, you're going to sign up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. All right. Congratulations. Now you're an Azure Cloud Engineer. <laughs> you can stop sharing. Thank you. Yeah, Kobe, man. You can't be using fair credit card, man. Be serious, man. Is it real? There's just no money on it. <laughs> Come on, man. They need to be able to charge at least one dollar on the card, man. You know, at least 50 cents on the card, man. Yeah, just leave this on for a while and let me check my can't see what's wrong. You want to show your screen? Uh, yeah, let me share. Okay. Create. Validation failed. Require information is missing or not valid. Hey, look at that. Is that anybody face this error? That's the same message I'm getting. Because you did not enter all the information you need to enter, sir. We went next, next, next. You just went direct to review and create. <laughs> Let's go back. Let's go all the way back. So you need to follow the steps, sir. You need to choose the options and everything that is required, right? Bam, bam, bam. Next disk, networking. So it's in the basics. Let's see what's in the basics that failed. What's here that failed? Central US right here. Okay. Next, next, next. So something is here that failed, right? Um the region. So changing this, let's see if it helps. And then changing it back. 
that's it. So networking. And then it resolves it. You see that? No more red up here. Next, 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 next. Give it a name. Ebo dash betting dash server. And then next, validation pass. Look at that. 89.23 per month and create. Download the private key and resource. That's it. That's it, done. So Kobe, did you realize what your, your error was? Uh, it was in the basic tab under size. It's something about my subscription. Yes, just change it, refresh it, change it. Who wants to share? Elvis? Far behind now. Huh? I can share just share. Screen. Share your screen. I'm far. Okay, I'll share again. Yeah, because you are eating. <laughs> Can't see here. Yeah. So far, so good or what? Yeah, you're good. So now, yeah, maybe the name is wrong. I don't know why you call server that name, but that's that's huh? I don't know why you call your server that. Uh, right there, availability options. Availability See options. There? Okay. Why this would you? One. Why don't you use a dash in the server name to dash? Get, yeah, you know. Okay. There you go. Okay. Yeah, we have West Central and East Central. Where did you create your resource group? This is resource. This is the resource I'm creating still. I right? create a resource. No, you need to create a resource group first. Resource group, yeah. Go home. Click on resource groups. Yeah, click OK. You don't have a resource group. Click on create yeah. resource group. Yep. First step, first create a resource group. Give it a name. Mm, fine. You can call it underscore, whatever I want to call it. Right. If you want to give it a long name, it has to be underscore, right? For resource groups. For servers, it has to be dash. So you need to select your region before, before you create a resource group, right? Right there. Consider your region right there. You can use any region. You're on the East Coast, right? So East one is closer to you. East one. East one. East one is probably North Virginia. Are you in your you're in North Carolina? So that's that's you. East US, there you go. That's one. You see that? But hold on, hold on. Go back. Go previous. Look at your resource group name. Elvis underscore first underscore res group. Guys, if I if you guys work with me in, in, in the job, I, I will not be happy with you guys because the way you name things is not humanly readable. <laughs> That's resource group. It's long. Yeah, but why don't you have an underscore after the first? You know? Some people working in the IT job with you are 65 years old. They don't want to stress their eyes anymore. They're about, they're, about, they're getting ready to retire. So Make everything readable, guys. Don't be the one that creates things that people don't see. You can leave it blank. You can add a tag if you want, but you can leave it blank. Okay. Value? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, value. Give it whatever name you want. This is tags are tags are open. You can name a tag whatever you want. It doesn't even matter. With tags, you can do whatever you want, guys. Um, done? Mm hmm No, hold on, hold on. After create, that's what click on create. Mm. Now you have a resource group. 
Now you can create a resource. No, no, no. You can go home and go home. Right there, create a resource. Create a resource. And now virtual machine. I know we're way above time, guys. Sorry. Virtual machine, right? I like create. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Yeah, create. Guys, please, please, please. Now you follow the steps of creating a resource now. You got it? Now here, you're going to select the resource group. There you go. And I give it a name. And because you create a resource group in East US, by default, you'll be creating things in East US. Again, your server names, you have to use the dash. Server names, is, you have to use a dash, not underscore. Server names, use a dash. Resource group names, use an underscore. Okay, that's it. Scroll down. You can choose your operating system. No, 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 no. Image is the operating system. Ubuntu 22.04. Ubuntu server 22.04. And then next, the size. Why is it not coming up? Yeah, this is the problem I had. Size, if you click all sizes, it goes to a new page. Okay, we have size. No, so, no, 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 no. When did you create your account? Hmm? When did you create your account? Today. Yeah, it hasn't been validated. Just now. Just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why. It takes okay. 24 hours for AWS. Uh, sorry. It takes 24 hours for AWS, Azure, or Google to validate your account. That's why. Your account hasn't validated. They need to charge they need to charge your credit card at least 15 cents or five cents to make sure that after your one year of free trial, because you only have one year free trial account. After your one year of free trial, they can charge you if you start using the Azure full time. So that's why. You won't be able to see sizes until you your time account is validated. So sorry. All right. Guys, I asked if everyone creates accounts like two weeks ago, man. Man, okay. So now that we have, uh, we are out, out of time, guys. So um, to, to delete those machines, I want to show you how to delete those machines. So let's go ahead and terminate them, and then we'll end class. So I'm going to go here, select that server, and three dots to the side here. Oh, delete, sorry. Delete the server. Click on Apply Force Delete. Delete the server. Delete. Same thing here. Click on the server. Delete it. Check apply. Delete. Delete it. And that's it. You have created a virtual machine in Azure VM, in Azure, and you have logged, uh, but we haven't logged into it. So next class on Wednesday, we are going to log into the virtual machine. Um, delete this one as well. Delete. I'm gonna apply false deletes so that it deletes it now. Delete. Okay, so, boom. So mine on sizes, it it says I'm in a free trial period, but I I still don't see any sizes because your account hasn't been validated. Right. When did you uh -huh. create your account? 